everybody. Good afternoon. And uh, yeah, thank you, Ian, for that introduction. And I wish you all the very best with your launch today as well. Um, well, this is an invitation to invite you into my world of wildlife filmmaking. I'll absolutely be putting the spotlight on storytelling and um, really focusing on innovation, which is uh, very much our lifeblood. And, and we really do take our inspiration from nature that is constantly evolving to just keep one step ahead uh, of what's going on around it, both in terms of other life forms and, and the environment in which it lives. So I'm going to just start by playing a clip. I've got a number of clips this afternoon, um, which uh, is an invitation to uh, transport you to the world of natural history. I was at the Naturalist Unit for 25 uh, amazing years and um, during that time on any one day we could have up to 50 crews on location in seven continents capturing uh, the amazing images you've just seen and we'd be delivering about 150 hours of content every year and that really was to all audiences from the big BBC One blockbusters, BBC Two, uh, BBC Four, Radio Four, Tweet of the Day if you're up at six o'clock in the morning, uh, right through to CBB, CBBC, Radio Four, worldwide uh, and online as well. Very importantly, uh, the new sort of earth.co.uk and earth.com, the social media sites now, which certainly uh, often for the younger audiences, they are uh, connecting with us via that mobile first world. And those big blockbusters, I mean, they can reach up to, in their lifetime, 750 million people. So developing the um, art and craft of storytelling and, and what makes compelling uh, visual narrative and sound narrative to kind of connect people to share your passion, which is really what drives me, is very much at the heart of uh, what I'll be chatting about uh, this afternoon. Um, just to give you a little bit of back history, um, I was first sort of... Um, inspired I guess was in 1979 like many of my colleagues I was 14 years old uh, watching David Attenborough's Life on Earth and that absolutely captured my curiosity to be fascinated in the world around me and I'm sure it got my travel bug going because I wanted to go diving on those coral reefs that I'd just seen on the telly uh, and that kind of really shaped uh, where I ended up uh, and um, when I uh, think about um, what is it about what I do in terms of wildlife filmmaking that really um, keeps us number one in the world uh, and so relevant and important? I'm going to put the spotlight on innovation and high quality. And in the world of natural history filmmaking, there are three sort of areas where we uh, really focus on innovation. One of those is in technology. Uh, you'll be very familiar with those 10 minute um, films at the end of those big blockbuster programs where you find out how on earth did those camera crews get those amazing images and it's usually what people are talking about the next day more than the biology <laughs> but um, I'll be doing the spotlight on on technology um, uh, and very importantly I've just touched on that new technology to reach new audiences um, in a world that's changing in the media landscape so rapidly um, how do we connect to audiences in a digital space uh, we've been developing stuff in the VR virtual reality space um, audience attractions now theme parks I mean Tim Schmidt literally down the road has got a commission for three uh, four new Edens three in China you know these are uh, audience attractions where people can get hands-on with nature and and start to have their own experience um, I'm going to focus first of all on then technology. Those are the three areas, sorry, technology, uh, reaching audiences in new ways um, and new platforms. And then thirdly, and very importantly, and, and my personal passion is the art and craft of storytelling and how storytelling, uh, uh, the great storytelling can have a greater impact to connect your audience um, to what you're doing. So first up, technology. Um, you'll be familiar, we're always pushing, um, whether it's the latest format, at the moment we're largely our format is something called 4K or ultra high def, if any of you watching the TV and bought a new TV you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, I mean Japan very much is pushing for what they call 8K, it's 8,000 pixels across a screen. Uh, they'll be pushing that for when they launch uh, the Olympics in Tokyo in 2020. So you've got this huge sort of technology um, industry that drives, um, from our perspective, we're always on the cutting edge of testing out and often shaping new formats. We play around with time, high speed. We play around with um, you know, a lot of um, sensors in terms of uh, low light, inf infrared, um, time lapse, speed it up, slow it down, macro, um, and even you know, you've got some big 5K cameras now on the Russian side of the International Space Station with, the, um, with Earthcast that from 250 miles up, 
can literally get an image a couple of meters across. They could they could have an image of me from 250 miles up, which I think is just mind blowing. Um, so technology is really really important. Um, the big landmarks um, we've had most recently: um, Africa, uh, Life Story, uh, Hunt was this autumn made by an independent production in Bristol. Those are very much at the cutting edge. And what I'm going to show you here is uh, a little clip of all the technology and the kit that is being used on the new um, blockbuster, which will come out this autumn which is called Planet Earth 2. Uh, Planet Earth, the original was 10 years ago, so 10 years on, um, there's a whole load of new stories, I mean thanks to amazing um, work by all the scientists and people out on location discovering new behaviours and new things, that gives us great uh, material in order to tell new scientific discoveries. Newness is our currency, uh, so having good partnerships with the scientific community and the conservation community is absolutely um, critical to, to keeping our audiences connected with what's going on and then what you'll see in this clip is some of the kit uh, that we've been using on the new uh, landmark that will come out this autumn on BBC One. I mean, the, I'll share three themes or trends that, that kind of drive uh, a lot of what we're doing, and that is, from an audience perspective, becoming ever more immersive. Um, and a lot of those pieces of kit, those sort of octocopters, Movi, Steadicams, um, and you see it in the movies as well, and we take a lot of inspiration from uh, Hollywood and, and drama and, and sports in terms of, you know, that ringside seat, that invitation to the audience to get ever closer. So a lot of that technology absolutely creates a much more visceral experience for the audience. Um, being more accessible, uh, and that's about relevance, uh, always absolutely essential in terms of making things feel more kind of relevant to my, my world. And importantly, um, connectivity, being more connected, and that really is where the digital world has utterly taken off now. I mean, classically now, when I'm watching a show, I'll almost certainly have a, a, a Twitter feed going along by the side of it, because you're getting that very quick, instant response to, I love it, I hate it, what's this, what's that? And importantly, the audience take their own inspiration from the story and then start to craft their own and suddenly things just kind of spiral off into their own world and of course the beauty of the digital um, or the internet is that that short form content can become uh, material to be shared uh, and for stories to evolve in their own right so that that in terms of those are the themes that are very much um, shaping the direction of travel that, that we've been moving in um, I've touched on reaching audiences in terms of the digital space the VR space I'm just going to show you a clip now um, a project we worked on we looked launched two years ago. Uh, it was actually in Japan. Uh, they build a lot of shopping centres in Japan, uh, but apparently shops on their own aren't enough to attract people to come and buy. They all have to have their own unique kind of attraction. So there is a, a shopping centre just outside Tokyo. Uh, on the top floor is something called Orbi. Uh, and um, Orbi is a theme attraction for people to go and visit, particularly focused towards the younger uh, kids, but it's for families. And um, there are 14 installations, and they've been uh, made using that amazing imagery. We, we create, you know, our treasure chest of sort of, uh, I call it our, our archive footage, what you've just seen there becomes our kind of natural crown jewels. Um, we use that an awful lot to make shows uh, with new storylines. But in this case, uh, we worked with Sega, the gaming industry, uh, who were working on the tech, bringing that amazing archive together to create a new audience attraction uh, for people to come and engage and have their own experience of the natural world. So the third topic I'm just going to focus on now is um, what I call the art or science of storytelling, which is was a real passion of mine. And when I took on the role of head of the unit four years ago, uh, one of my challenges was um, I said we, we would be delivering 150 hours of natural history content per year. But I became increasingly aware that in order to reach audiences in much more sophisticated ways, we needed to develop uh, the, the tone, the style, uh, the approach um, such that actually whilst everything at its heart had factual integrity uh, uh, and it's worth saying that the, the science that sits behind every fact in the shows we make is backed up by two credible scientific facts so factual integrity is absolutely sacrosanct but then the expression of that, whilst it will have a natural history element, usually filming uh, animals doing uh, amazing things, um, the way in which that story manifests itself can be quite varied. And I needed a framework 
so that um, when we were putting out shows that were per perhaps perceived as being more um, animal character led or more sort of, you know, we, dare we say it, put names to animals to make them a little bit more appealing for, you know, audiences that may not choose to watch um, what they perceive to be hardcore science. Uh, so at one end of the spectrum we had those and then at the other end we might have much more thesis driven shows with a real kind of um, meaty um, uh, ecology or, or thesis that sits in uh, underneath it. So what I did was I took all the shows from 2009 to 2012 over three years and then I kind of looked at them on a spectrum which is this, don't, don't panic, it's not death by PowerPoint, um, but basically um, three years of data at the bottom uh, on a spectrum at the far left uh, shows where I felt they had a much uh, stronger uh, factual content, so factual heavy. So classically, we've got their BBC4 uh, Nature's Microworlds. Each half hour show is the ecology of a particular place on the planet, like Namibia or Monterey Bay. Um, at that far left, um, shows that sit in that area are characterised by uh, a, a desire to discover nature. So we've made a lot of expedition shows, Expedition Borneo, Expedition Animals and Abyss, you know, with a real sense of quest and discovery and revelation. Um, certainly when we do... Um, uh, we've got there sort of coming into uh, the middle area, we've got Spring Watch. Um, whilst that is, as you head towards that middle, you've got that hybrid between cute little chicks that are being uh, born. Um, you've also got Chris Packham in there often doing quite a hardcore piece on um, migrations or, or, or um, you know, getting into the real science of the ecology of natural history. Um, Moving across, and I've put Big Blue Live, which was our big BBC One show last year, which was an invitation to the audience uh, in August last year to see live from Monterey Bay uh, images of Big Blue Whales, which was the most amazing and certainly a career highlight for me. Um, what was interesting about the format of that show was, was um, the little cute otters were literally going viral three-minute clips reaching 11 million people in about 24 hours, which was just incredible, and all they did was squeak. <laughs> However, the bit that I was most proud of um, was the fact that right at the heart of that, that show, which was in peak time in BBC One, was a really, really strong conservation story. Um, as many of you be aware, um, certainly 30 years ago, uh, blue whales were um, hunted almost to the point of extinction uh, and in that time frame, I mean um, 30 years, the population now has absolutely transformed or, and, um, and got back to a healthy breeding population. So there was a real opportunity there with the presenters and Hugh Fernley Whittingstall was there as part of the presenter team to tell that really strong, very important uh, conservation story and we didn't shy away from it but we embedded it in the context of other aspects of the show that, that appealed to very importantly that eight o'clock broad audience and um, that that combination of those different story elements within a, in effect a live magazine show delivered five million or twelve million over the week over the three shows moving then to the right hand side this is much more in tune with the sort of um, the heart and the soul uh, invitations you know we do the three part as an invitation to wild Japan wild Patagonia we've got wild Mexico and wild New Zealand coming up they're very much um, it's about more the, the romance sometimes of, of visiting an exotic place and immersing yourself in a new world um, and then often I mentioned um, uh, the importance of um, people and presenters in relation to their environment or me and my otter, that relationship between man and the natural world. Those stories, you know, Gordon Buchanan absolutely epitomises those with his uh, polar bear family and me style of programming. And then at the far end, uh, we do do what I call more the animal dramas, whether that's the big cat diaries or, or opportunities to sort of fall in love with an animal and then follow it through its trials and tribulations of everyday life life. Um, so that's, that sort of just gives you a spectrum and that helped me uh, when I was trying to, A, uh, um, when we were thinking about how do you as a producer tell your story, it gives you a framework to think about who your audience is, how do you want to tell your story, are you factual content rich, are you more invitational in a more heartfelt way, uh, but being mindful of working with both of those in tandem if you want to maximise um, people's interest uh, in, in, in your story. And there was an interesting piece of research done uh, in 2004 which identified six reasons why people watch TV. And that was to escape, to experience, connect, for comfort, 
unwind and indulge. And, and there's no doubt um, we're very fortunate in, in natural history. Uh, those shows that sit right at the heart of, of that spectrum uh, do all of those. Uh, and so, you know, if you're lucky enough to pull in five million uh, on a night, then understanding the science that sits behind that around people's behaviours, people's, people's desires uh, and what they're interested in, uh, you become more sophisticated uh, in your ability to connect people to your stories. Um, what I'm going to show now is a little clip, it's a little heads up. This is the Planet Earth 2 which will come out this autumn. It'll start getting trailed probably at the end of the summer, but I thought um, it's a, a good example where you'll see the, those three elements coming together, where you'll have the technology, uh, the latest immersive uh, visual uh, um, imagery, uh, certainly the, the art and craft of storytelling, these big landmarks, we absolutely set out to say something profound about the planet on a global level, but often the storytelling will invite you in through will the little turtle live or die. Um, so again, it's, it's that, that sort of bringing together those two elements uh, seamlessly uh, as, a, as an enjoyable experience. Um, and when this um, landmark goes out, it'll be six one hours. You know, in addition to that, we've made or we're making uh, six virtual reality experiences, uh, which you can view either in your Google Cardboard or on an iPad, the, uh, the hashtag 360 uh, video experience where you can be kind of uh, looking around at what's going on behind as well as in front of camera uh, and, and, a, and a comprehensive digital um, offering as well. So we're having to m basically adapt and evolve to be wherever our audiences are at. So this is just a little um, preview of what's coming up. And uh, I just thought, just before I show you my uh, final clip, I thought I'd just share with you and reflect a moment on a couple of uh, quotes that I've certainly found very inspiring to shape my thinking that uh, I thought I'd share with you in the hopes that it might inspire uh, some of you here to also think about how we can work uh, again, more collaboratively, which is absolutely the key to our mutual success uh, and how to connect with not ourselves here, but with others that we want to invite on the journey. Um, and I often, you know, in terms of that storytelling, for me it is that duality between uh, stimulating the intellectual curiosity and at the other end of the spectrum, um, uh, eliciting uh, empathy. So my first quote is uh, Rowan Kizarnik's, empathy is the art of stepping imaginatively into the shoes of someone else. It doesn't just make you good, it is good for you. And it is the key to healthy relationships, creative thinking, and forging the human bonds that make life worth living. In order to help sort of understand ourselves, I liked this one by William Burback. Nothing is so powerful as an insight into human nature. What compulsions drive a person, what instincts dominate their action, if you know these things about a person, you can touch them at the core of their being. And finally, this is probably um, my favourite, the one I live my life by every day, which is Theodore Roosevelt, which is to keep your eyes on the stars and your feet on the ground. And I always say that when you're thinking about your story, your idea, your research, um, I always have three frames of reference in which I sort of scrutinise every project, every story, every idea, and I challenge myself to think about it, why is it relevant to me uh, or my audience, um, because we are by our nature selfish genes and we have a personal need that needs to be fulfilled, uh, why it's relevant to the people I know, friends and family and the people we want to connect with, and, and then ultimately uh, the holy grail relevant to humankind. And when you are embarking on something where you can line all those three things, the ability to uh, get buy-in and connections uh, uh, becomes so much more greater because there is a, a complete invitation and opportunity for everyone to play their part. Uh, and, and I often, I started, when I started being the head of unit four years ago, people used to joke and say, well, is it time for global domination? And I used to smile sweetly thinking, what is that? <laughs> uh, uh, I've now four years, and I actually, to be fair, Ian, I only uh, walked out the door of the BBC five days ago. <laughs> so I am completely that little chick, <laughs> yet to fly. Um, uh, is not global domination, but global empowerment. Uh, so the more uh, we can move into that direction, I think is uh, only a good one for all of us. So my final clip um, is, I take my inspiration from 
everybody, to be perfectly honest, but I was very inspired by what Danny Boyle did for the opening ceremony of the Olympics um, in terms of there was a show that united you know, millions of people globally. And actually, in many regards, sport isn't that different from natural history. Most of the audience love football and they love natural history um, and it goes global and it just uh, connects with people everywhere. And, and I was sort of challenging myself to think, what would our equivalent be? So if there was a wild weekend or a wild week on earth and we wanted to showcase our passion, our stories to unite people in a moment of space and time, I, I, I said, you know, it's not inconceivable now with digital technology to unite 500 million people in a moment of space and time what would our equivalent of that be? So I produced this two-minute clip, it's, um, which is not a programme, I should say. Uh, it is, it's a stimulating, uh, creative um, clip. Uh, and my invitation to you would be, what would your expression of it be in your own worlds, whether you're in conservation, academia, teaching, learning, um, or, or any other aspect, to be honest? So just to summarise, I, I often sum up by saying it's one earth, that's our home, it's one life, uh, that's us and all living creatures that we share the planet with and it's one story. And that story can enrich our lives through the power of innovation and new ways to tell stories. I do think it's uh, possible to inspire all of us to connect and care that little bit more about our natural world. And I believe that new insights and knowledge combined with great storytelling does stimulate the heart and the mind to help us better understand ourselves, the world in which we live in, our relationships to each other, from which we can start to attribute greater value. And I hope that we can all move forward together to a more sustainable and healthy natural world for all of us. And I certainly very much look forward to meeting many of you over today and tomorrow morning I'll be around on this really important topic. And I wish Ian and everyone here and Judith uh, every success with such an important uh, launch today for the Institute of Sustainable Earth. Thank you. <laughs>